Welcome to Budget Countdown. In a few days from now, the Finance Minister will announce the much-anticipated union budget. This will be the first budget of the new government and Nirmala Sitaraman's seventh consecutive. This budget, of course, is more important in more ways than one. The government uh, goes into this budget with a very comfortable fiscal position. Approximately with over 1 lakh crore rupees cushion is available to the government on back of the RBI bonanza and better than expected tax collections. We have with us uh, a very esteemed panel joining in uh, to talk about what the industry expects, what India Inc. needs to do, and of course, uh, talk about the journey in the building blocks to Vixit Bharat. We have with us Anisha, President Fiki, Harsha Vardhan Agarwal, Senior Vice President Fiki, and Subrakanta Panda, Immediate Past President Fiki. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us uh, today on the show. Anisha, I'll start with you first. And as the president of FIKI, let's talk about the mood before we go into this budget. How optimistic, how buoyant, and how confident is India in feeling about growth, about demand, about generally business? Uh, Simina, good afternoon. Pleasure to be here with you. Overall, I'd say the mood is balanced, tending towards optimistic. There are some industries which are clearly very buoyant right now. Real estate's a classic example there. Uh, there are some that are moving along uh, quite well. You see tourism uh, actually probably a little more on the buoyant side as well. Uh, the auto industry has been moving quite well, seen some uh, signs of uh, slowness, but really not very significant. Uh, and overall, therefore, we feel that uh, while consumption is lower than what it has been last year, the economy is still in very good shape. Oh, optimistic. It's good, to, it's good to hear that. I believe you're echoing the sentiment of the industry, not just of m and But, Harsha, I'll come to you next. Uh, I mean, we've talked extensively about Vixit Bharat and the road and the journey to that. In your opinion, uh, what are expectations? We saw what happened at the interim budget uh, when where things were left at that. It was a short 56-minute speech uh, trying to say enough and, enough and leaving you wanting more. As we go into this budget, uh, what are your expectations? So I think uh, we want you know, uh, investment which leads to inclusive growth. I think that is what will overall propel the growth in the economy uh, and when we say inclusive growth you know uh, uh, the employment should grow uh, at the same time how does the government improve the skills you know that is where you know uh, we need to see government intervening you know they have done a lot of things initiatives has been uh, announced those are again you know something you know which we need to take forward you're right. Skills, employment, uh, bringing it up to the curve. I mean, I believe a lot has changed pre-pandemic and the world we live in today. Uh, but I'll come to Subrakanta as well. Mr. Panda, uh, I mean, what are your expectations? Let's start with that. Uh, highlight the key, the top three key initiatives you believe the government should be undertaking and start with what it is uh, in terms of this budget. So, uh, uh, Samina, first of all, uh, thank you for having us on the show. Now, in terms of the top two or three recommendations that uh, Fiki has had, uh, I think it's to continue with the good work which uh, we have seen over the last few budgets. And I think topmost on that list is government uh, spending on infrastructure, which, of course, the interim budget had an announcement uh, which took it up to 11.11 uh, .11 trillion rupees. And uh, that is something that, uh, you know, has worked out very well during the uh, pandemic and its immediate uh, aftermath. And uh, while everyone agrees that, uh, you know, private sectors uh, spending needs to increase, and indeed it is beginning to, but I think the focus uh, of government infrastructure spending on, uh, you know, various things uh, uh, is a very productive and good way to go about it. Uh, the second thing I would say is um, that, you know, we are certainly looking for uh, measures which will uh, uh, continue to improve the ease of doing business and reduce the cost of uh, doing business. And that is particularly important uh, from a manufacturing sector point of view, uh, which really needs to do well in order to complement what the services sector is doing in terms of creating jobs. Uh, and the third thing I would look at is uh, some simplification in, um, you know, in the tax regime, whether it is uh, in terms of, um, you know, the TDS or TCS rates, uh, 
from our point of view, we have uh, we have suggested measures which would um, uh, you know which would lead towards greater simplification and thereby uh, uh, you know do away with classification disputes, etc. Uh, and where litigation has already uh, uh, been initiated, what is uh, what is the best way forward in terms of uh, bringing that litigation to an end, so that uh, you know industry can focus on doing what it do does best, which is contribute to the nation's growth. You're absolutely right, and I believe uh, everyone would resonate with that. Ananta Goenka as well joins in. Ananta, how do you feel ahead of the budget? What is your mood? Are you excited? Are you optimistic? Uh, what is demand? What is growth looking like right now, just ahead of the budget? Right. No, I'm fairly optimistic about uh, the economic situation right now. Uh, the good thing about uh, the government now coming in is a sign of continuity. Even with the cabinet postings that we've seen, it is a sign of continuity. Uh, in the last few years, we have seen a very long-term vision that has been set out uh, by the finance minister and continuously acting on that uh, year on year. Uh, this year being the first year of uh, the new government in a way, we hope to see again another five-year vision uh, from the government and a continuity of the past that has been happening. Uh, the few actions that certainly, as my colleagues shared, uh, continue, continued investment in infrastructure, boosting manufacturing, looking at uh, employment as an important area uh, of uh, job creation, and finally, how do we boost uh, demand to make sure that private investment uh, increases. We've been resting a lot on the public investment part. We need to boost private investment going forward. Oh, I think that is a unanimous uh, sentiment across the board, Anand. But Anish, I'll come back to you on consumption. We saw how Bharat voted a few months ago. Uh, you know, rural consumption has been a sour point in the country now for quite some time. Uh, some may even go to the extent of calling it rural distress. What do you think needs to be done to boost rural consumption? Because from what I understand, most people who've gone back to villages are even refusing to come back to work, it seems. So consumption has been slightly lower, 6.8% in fiscal 23, down to 4% in fiscal 24. But on balance, uh, Savina, it's really not that bad. And while, yes, there have been signs of rural distress, if you look at it over the past four years, rural actually has held up very well. If we look at tractor sales as a proxy, the tractor industry grew 27% in the first year after COVID and uh, grew 9% in the year after that and then had a slight decline in the following year, followed by a flattish year that we expect this year. Uh, so on balance, if you look at a four-year period, the cumulative growth is really not that bad. So yes, we've seen some vast increases and we've seen some softness around it, uh, but it's not something that concerns us. There may be some measures that are required uh, but we still feel from an industry standpoint that the key focus has to be on long-term growth, on long-term capital formation, on investment, on infrastructure, on making India the manufacturing hub of the world by reducing cost of manufacturing, uh, reducing logistics costs. These are the key areas that are going to put India in great stead going forward. And uh, we will see some softness in some areas, but overall the economy is in, in such strong shape that uh, the softness in those pockets doesn't really worry us a whole lot. We shall take a cue from that because you're right, if India's got to become a manufacturing hub, uh, we need to bring on logistic costs which stand at 14-15% as compared to our peers where logistic cost stands at 10-11%. to Anant, I see you nodding, so you want to comment on that? What do you think needs to be done on the logistic front? Because it seems like that is a significant piece of the puzzle to make India and achieve a dream of becoming China plus one or that manufacturing hub we aspire to be. There are a right. So I think for us, our biggest front. strength Many in India is GST. our... Oh. Anish, you want to quickly make a point and then I'll quickly go to Anant on that. I heard both of you talking. Oh. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'll just say that a lot of actions have been taken already. GST is one aspect in there. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we will need some transformative ideas, including setting up new rail corridors, for example, um, and a and number of other actions that will require us to get that cost down much lower. Anand, over to you.
Thank you, Anish. Uh, so I think our biggest strength in India is uh, our demographic uh, population that is growing. And uh, all of these people need to be employed. And that will happen through growth in manufacturing. We do have some disadvantages today, but they are getting bridged. As we shared, logistic cost. We are seeing huge investments in highways, in railways, in multimodal transportation systems. And we are seeing simplification of uh, whether it is GST, tax systems, where earlier trucks used to be stuck in uh, Octroy or toll nakas, that has simplified substantially. The time taken for truck movement has improved. So all of that, I'd say, is a work in progress to improving our logistics costs. So I think that is one key element. Second is, if you look at power cost, we are moving more and more towards uh, renewable power. And as that shift happens, uh, we expect the cost of power to, to come down. And the third is, as we need to continue to invest in skilling so that productivity improvement in labor too happens. I think as some of these shifts happen, our manufacturing costs will come down. And with the uncertainty and the global stresses that we are seeing between, say, US and China, I think if we can uh, take advantage of this situation, uh, we certainly will be on the route for uh, becoming a manufacturing hub for the world. Right. Subrakanta, so, taking a cue from that, we achieve and want to be the manufacturing hub. We need private capex to pick up. Uh, one of the points that I've heard a few people talk about is extension of the sunset clause. Now, this comes up every year, I do know, uh, to provide extended extension of the tax benefit to new manufacturing companies. Uh, how important is this, and will it have a significant impact to encourage uh, new facilities being set up? So this is something that uh, that uh, Fiki has strongly advocated for, which is the 115 BAB uh, is what you're referring to, which is the 15% uh, tax rate for uh, new manufacturing units. Now, uh, you know, in the past that has been extended one year at a time. And in fact, we have made a point that when you're looking at grabbing the opportunity of China plus one, these are decisions which are which have already been made or are in the process of being made in, in uh, global boardrooms. And you, you don't want anything to come in the way of that decision to shift to India. And uh, therefore, instead of extending it by a year or anything of that sort, we think it should be, in fact, extended over a, uh, over a longer period of time, say three to five years, because if that is the, you know, that shouldn't be the last straw on the camel's back, which, which uh, detracts from a decision to invest in India. And uh, conversely, I mean, if, if, uh, if some investment doesn't come through despite this, then there is no concession which is being granted in any case. Um, so that apart, you know, we, we've all talked about the importance of manufacturing because as well as the services sector is doing uh, for, um, you know, for us to absorb the young, young uh, men and women coming into the workforce, uh, the manufacturing sector has to do well. And, uh, you know, it has, it has uh, been range bound in the, 15 to 17%, 18% range, not just in the last five or 10 years, but longer than that. Uh, but I think the sort of the breakthrough moment is coming because of, a, uh, because of that laser sharp focus on increasing the, enhancing the, uh, the ease of doing business and reducing the cost of doing business. Uh, I believe that, you know, we are nearing that inflection point where we will be able to uh, sort of break out of this uh, linear mode and, and uh, look at a step change in terms of growth. Harsha, keeping the focus with encouraging uh, private capex, uh, many of the PLI schemes uh, are also getting closer to their fifth year. So review seems more or less a given, right? Uh, what are you expecting on that? Are you expecting the government to consider more PLI schemes, uh, incentivize participation from S MSMEs? Uh, how would you read the, uh, the possible tweaks or changes uh, that the budget could bring along? I think PLI schemes are important and it, sh it should continue. And from that perspective, uh, uh, the PLI schemes can, uh, uh, first of all, also uh, uh, shift to the MSMEs or different new sectors needs to be introduced. And whether the uh, employment generated, whether it can uh, move on to the companies, you know, which is generating more employment. So those are some of the expectations and uh, things, you know, which we believe will help in overall improvement of the manufacturing. Anisha, you want to comment on the PLI uh, scheme of things? Because this is one thing that the government introduced and it's actually worked really well for India Inc. and for a, for a number of sectors. 
uh, most of them are coming to their five-year period. Do you feel like more needs to be done, extensions need to come in, different types of PLI schemes, or maybe something more uh, needs to be brought in, in your opinion? Sabina, I agree. This has worked very well. And uh, in many cases that we've seen, the incentives were set up in a way to achieve a specific result. And uh, we've seen those results in some cases. We are on our way to seeing them in a few more cases as well. Uh, so on balance, I'd say uh, the PLI schemes have been a great success. Hi. The question around incentives, though, is broader. And what we discuss with many of our members at Fiki as well is that there should be an economic benefit before we ask the government for any incentives. The benefit has to accrue to the economy longer term. And uh, that's where we'd look at... Uh, possibly a few areas, but only areas where we can justify the fact that the incentive can create a long-term lasting benefit uh, that is good for the economy. And uh, therefore, we probably would not expect the same slew of PLI schemes that we've seen in the past, maybe a few targeted ones. And uh, what targeted ones, Anish, are you thinking? Uh, so at this stage, uh, I would not have a specific industry in mind because we've been getting various input from our members to create justification for that, uh, and, and we haven't finalized that as yet. Uh, but the principles behind it are ones that the incentive has to be for a specific time period and has to result in a specific action. And the example I'd give here is for electric three-wheelers. Electrification for three-wheelers, which is really last-mile mobility, as well as the small four-wheeler cargoes, the tempos that uh, transport goods and cities, has gone from zero to 20% as an industry over the last three to four years. Uh, and we expect that to reach 100% by 2030. The incentives that the government set up for that in terms of FAME 2, uh, and now potentially FAME 3 and a PLI scheme, have helped transform that industry. And by 2030, when we are 100% electric, the industry is not likely to need incentives anymore. So that's a classic example where incentives have done their work in transforming an industry, which has a major impact on reducing the fuel bill for India, as well as reducing pollution in cities, which is where the last mile is concentrated. Uh, so these are, this is one example, but others have to follow the same suit. You know, this uh, reducing carbon footprint is going to become more and more significant as India becomes this power hub, right? Do you feel uh, more on that needs to be done? Harsha Vardhan, you want to comment on that? Sorry, can you repeat? I said, I said reducing carbon footprint is going to become even more significant as we embark on this journey of becoming a manufacturing hub. Uh, what can be done, in your opinion, uh, to sort of, you know, encourage India Inc. to focus on that? I think sustainability has been one of the most uh, very important theme of the government. And going forward, uh, we believe, you know, it is going to be. Uh, from that perspective, as Anis was giving, talking about the example, uh, about the EVs. So yes, electric, uh, electric vehicles are certainly one of the areas, you know, which will help in that. Second is the renewable energy. So those are certainly you know some of the areas you know which will help in the carbon neutralization shurkanta i want to come to you on what has happened on the heels of the budget the karnataka cabinet has approved a draft bill mandating the 50 percent of management jobs and 70 percent of non-management roles be reserved for locals uh, do you feel this state government's decision will impact business activities and i mean for the for the fear of it other states may, may possibly follow so, uh, Samina, this is not something that I've uh, read upon uh, properly, so I, I would be a little hesitant to comment uh, in, uh, extensively on it. But um, broadly going by what I've seen in terms of the headlines, uh, the concern certainly from an industry perspective is that, uh, you know, will it have a sort of a cascading effect with, uh, with uh, you know, other states wanting to do similar things? Now, having said that, uh, you know, it is, it is important to... Uh, to see that employment generation takes place and, uh, you know, everybody's rights are protected. But uh, that being said, uh, I would uh, think that one needs to look at it a little bit more in detail, understand, uh, I mean, the rationale, one can sort of uh, guess what it is, but, you know, how it is structured and, uh, 
uh, the the risks of uh, of uh, similar cascading measures, which will then you know create different types of uh, barriers. Just when we are celebrating that uh, that GST has uh, sort of removed uh, internal barriers to trade. Right. Anant, uh, because we, of course, have uh, short of time, so I want to take different questions with all of you. But Anant, uh, why don't we come down reforms on land and labor? Now, this is uh, what we've talked about extensively with the center and state need to, of course, talk a little bit more in every sense. Uh, uh, it didn't happen when the government was there in full majority. Do you feel like land labor reform uh, should be an important objective that needs to see action sooner than later? No, absolutely. I think uh, there are four uh, labor laws that are waiting for approval. Uh, hopefully, these will all go through because irrespective of whether it's a coalition government or majority, uh, hopefully all the parties are positive towards that. It will only ensure uh, more safety and security for uh, uh, the, the workers in the factory, um, a higher level of uh, simplicity in the structure. So I, I don't think there is anything in the current labor laws that should be opposed by one or the other. So we're hopeful that the labor laws uh, will come into effect. Uh, the second is on the land. I think hopefully, again, here we can see more industrial parks, whether you call it SEZs or industrial parks kind of coming in, which will have power available more easily, uh, simpler ways of working, simpler one-window clearance systems, because while at many state levels they do talk about red carpet treatment and one window systems. I think if we can have a demarcated area where the rules are simple, where power is available, where there are strong ETP and STP systems, I think setting up those uh, uh, land banks uh, will certainly help. And I do believe we have a lot of them that already exist but are not fully utilized. So if there's some endeavors that can be taken towards uh, building these parks uh, or, or land banks, uh, I think that will really help industry. Hmm. Anisha, export enhancement measures, uh, would you like uh, to hear, uh, you know, or would, would that be sort of the need of the hour to help India Inc. export more? Uh, anything from an industry representation? Uh, exports is going to be one of the most important areas for us because for us to be able to reach our Vixit Bharat goals, manufacturing has to increase multifold. And uh, for that, while there can be some short-term measures, we would really focus on long-term competitiveness. And uh, let's take the auto industry as an example. How can we take measures to make India the hub for manufacturing automobiles? Uh, attract all global players to come here and set up manufacturing in India. But can we make manufacturing in India competitive, make it easy to do business that, uh, that really uh, creates a situation where exports grow multifold, not uh, just a small increase based on some short-term incentives. Right. Subrakanta, one last question, uh, just to wrap this conversation up. What are the pain points of friction that need to be addressed, in your opinion? We've talked about everything we want and, of course, uh, what the industry expects, but what are those pain point areas that you need, or maybe the budget needs to resolve to actually encourage everything we've talked about and our dreams of Vixit Bharat? So, uh, so, you know, one point uh, I have uh, held for long is that, uh, you know, we shouldn't look at the budget for uh, addressing everything because, uh, you know, governance is a 365 days uh, exercise. Um, so from an industry perspective, and particularly if I look at, uh, continue with my focus on the manufacturing sector, um, I think we should look at ways and means to uh, reduce the interface that uh, industry has with, uh, you know, various uh, regulators or, uh, or state uh, authorities. Um, and, you know, drawing an analogy, for example, from the faceless assessment, which has worked so well when it comes to uh, income tax, uh, something that I strongly believe in and Fiki has advocated is if we can digitize all, uh, all records uh, and there is enough technology available today to, to ensure that, uh, you know, these can't be fudged at a later date. But if we can digitize all sorts of records that are required to be maintained by industry and then, uh, you know, have online inspections and keep, uh, you know, really physical interactions and phys physical inspections only to the bare minimum. I think these are sorts of measures which will, uh, you know, which will at one stroke do away with a lot of, uh, lot of uh, pain points. And the other thing, of course, is to rely on self-certification wherever possible. 
And again, of course, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, there will probably be somebody who tries, tries to take advantage of that. And you can always have exemplary sort of uh, uh, punishment for anybody who takes advantage of, uh, of concessions. But self-certification and uh, digitalization of records, uh, I think, are two points, uh, are two um, measures which will, uh, uh, you know, which will uh, uh, go a long way in reducing the pain point for, uh, for industry. Right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It was such a pleasure talking to all of you. We'll hopefully see you on Budget Day and to get a reaction uh, of what your thoughts were after the event is over. Thank you very much and have a good evening.